This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 153, recorded October 13th, 2011. Hi everyone, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Svalbard, no, not really, <laughs> from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Hi there. How you doing, Vincent? I thought you were in Svalbard. No, I'm not. I'm definitely not in Svalbard. I just love that name. That's yeah, cool. I love it, Svalbard. In fact, I first heard of it in a, in a book I, I read to one of my kids years ago. I think it was the Golden Compass and uh, Svalbard. And I didn't know it was a real place. Well, I was completely unfamiliar with the whole thing until this week. By the way, what we're talking about is a city in one of our stories today. We'll get to that. Right. Also joining us today, not from Svalbard, but from Western Massachusetts, is Alan Dove. Good to be here in relatively tropical western Massachusetts, yeah, relative to, to Svalbard. Svalbard. I bet you have cloudy skies today. We do, yes. It's amazing how your weather and ours is very similar. Oh, we're only about 100 miles apart. Yeah, we're not very far whatsoever. Good to have you both back today on a Thursday. We're doing some odd recording days to accommodate individual schedules. I don't know. I feel like when it's Monday, I have to get ready soon for TWIV when it's on a Thursday. Yeah, because uh, right. ordinarily my TWIV cram night is Thursday night, and so now it's I don't have many. I don't have many opportunities before that. So yeah, Thursday it kind of kind of rearranges the whole week for me. And then Friday, it's there's in, this big gap. It's empty. You go, oh wow! I don't have to do anything today. <laughs> it's kind of cool. It's good to switch things around. A but bit. It, it's good to have a schedule, though. Yes, we'll get back to it. So we don't have one for TWIP because Dixon can't keep to a schedule. <laughs> and as a consequence, we do fewer episodes. Alan, did you want to mention something before I we begin? I did. Yeah, we started off uh, and we, we talked a lot on the last episode, um, well, a little bit anyway, about uh, Steve Jobs, who had just died. And uh, I just saw the news today that somebody with a, um, I think, a bigger influence on technology died. Um, a lot of people have probably never heard of him, but I guarantee you've used his inventions. A fellow named Dennis Ritchie. Hey, crickets. Yeah, nobody's heard of him. <laughs> but he, <laughs> he was um, the primary developer of the C programming language. And, that I've uh, heard of co-developer of the Unix operating system. That I've heard of. And even if you don't think that you use C and Unix, you do every day. Uh, if you use a cell phone, if you drive a modern car, if you use any kind of electronic device, all these embedded systems are are built with these two fundamental pieces of, of technological isn't, architecture. Uh, isn't the Mac OS have Unix the underpinnings? The Mac, Mac operating system is, uh, is pretty much straight up Unix with a little, uh, little gloss applied to the surface. Um, and uh, and even the Windows operating system is extensively programmed in C, so you can't get away from Dennis's work. And uh, now he's gone. Yeah, maybe he and Steve Jobs will hang out now. Yeah, yeah. As they said on the uh, the Boing Boing site, um, uh, his process has terminated with exit code zero. Yeah, but then someone in the in the discussion said, "No, exit code one subroutine successful." Yeah, but zero is successful in C. One is successful in um, in bash coding in Unix. So. Okay, well, I'm not going to get into that argument. Yeah, that's, that's my no. understanding, anyway. Okay. <laughs> Notable awards: the Turing Award and the National Medal of Technology. Yeah, a Turing Good Award deal. sounds cool, right? Known for yeah. Altran B, BCPLC, Multics, and Unix. Wow. This fellow was a bit old, older than Steve Jobs. He was born yes. in 1941. Yeah. Hmm. 70s, still too young. Yeah, he probably had cancer, I would guess. He did. Hmm. Something gets you eventually. You know, we could right. probably note an important person every week passing. Yeah. In various fields. The week before, um, Bob Weisberg, a phage mm. virologist, had passed. Probably not the same impact as Dennis Ritchie or Steve Jobs, 
but nevertheless within our field's importance. Yeah. Nice it guy. Would, it would always start the show with a somber note, though, so I'm not sure we want to start doing that. Yeah, right. Did you know uh, Weisberg, Rich? I did. Really? So uh, you, not well, but I uh, but I knew him. You were a phage guy, is that why? Uh, partly because I was a phage guy. I think it goes back there. But my um, uh, I interacted with him. I spent uh, – I was the chair of the uh, – DNA viruses section of ASM for a couple of years. That's mm -hmm. section S or whatever. And Bob had some larger administrative role in the thing, and I interacted with him during that. Oh, yeah, and I think he used to show up at these uh, uh, Mountain Lake transcription meetings I went to. I think. I'm not sure. At any rate, hmm. I've known okay. him from around. I like that section mm -hmm. S. Section mm -hmm. S, right. That sounds... That's what we are, like Section S. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we have two papers today to talk about. To another two cool papers, they're all cool in virology. Yep. It's amazing. And this one is from Eurosurveillance. Now, what is Eurosurveillance from? It's a, it's a, it's a journal of something. No, it's Eurosurveillance. I'm thinking of Emerging Infectious Diseases, which is a right. journal of the CDC. All right, this is its own journal, Eurosurveillance.org. The title is Public Health Implications of an Outbreak of Rabies in Arctic Foxes and Reindeer in the Svalbard Archipelago, Norway, September 2011. This caught my eye. And it turns, yeah. out, it turns out to be an interesting story. Yes. This is on an island... I'm going to leave it to you to describe, Alan. Where is this place? This place is north. It's uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's almost as north as you can get. So you go to Norway, and you go north to the end of Norway, and then you keep going north across the in over the Arctic Ocean, and you come to some islands. And those are the Svalbard Islands. They're, um, uh, I think, the town... There, there's one town. It's this big set of islands up there, but there's one town um, called Longyearbyen, and it is the northernmost town in the world. Um, you sent us this this link to the Google Maps. It's just amazing. It yeah, because if you click on it, we'll put it in the show notes. You know, you're in this snow covered thing, and then as you zoom out, you realize. There's nothing. <laughs> There's nothing. How far There's... north of Norway you are. Yeah. I didn't realize this archipelago was even up there. It's like know? halfway up Green Greenland. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's just it's east of Greenland, it's north northeast of Iceland, north of Scandinavia. I mean anything that involves north of Scandinavia, you know you're you're deep into yeah. the snow. It looks like right? the, the area is greater than that of Norway, I would guess. It's quite a Pro large archipelago. Yeah, I'm not sure what projection they used for that map. So yeah, it could be often in the time. Arctic you get a lot of distortion. So that's the setting for this outbreak of rabies, which happened... Um, in Guess what? What's that? I just got, uh, just for kicks, I put uh, a, what, how, what, long urban mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> into the, the weather channel. <laughs> yeah, what's the weather like? Tell us. Uh, right now, it's light snow and 25 degrees. Centigrade. Uh, Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. It's cold. Uh, it's below freezing, yeah. So it wants to know if I want to add that to my saved guys. I think you ought to so do that. <laughs> for the next 10 days, we've got a high of 39 and a low of 29. Uh, and, and, and or low at low at 26. Pretty pretty even temperatures. We're talking lows and lows and 26, high 37, 39. It's not that bad, balmy. really. But that's, that's yeah, that's that's balmy, but it's mid October. Yeah, I guess it gets very uh, cold. And and, yeah, we got yeah, snow after, after the sun cloudy. sets, and that's a place that's going to have a sunset, and then months later the sun will rise. <laughs> Um, cold. I'm sure it gets much colder. Well, when you hear about this paper, you're going to wonder how all this work was done. It's so bloody cold, but they do have mm -hmm. buildings and heat and all that. So, well, and it's uh, this is happening in September. <clears throat> yes, when a, it's there's probably, a recent event, so it's yes. comparatively warm. So uh, in September, an Arctic fox attacked a woman in this city of Longyearbyen, 
which has 2,000 inhabitants on this island. And later the same day, the fox was most likely killed by a dog. And the, the fox was tested positive for rabies. And then following this death of the fox, the, the dog contacted four other people and did things that dogs usually do, like licking their hands and faces. Uh, 18th September, two reindeer were behaving oddly on the outskirts of the city. They were both shot <laughs> and found to be uh, positive for rabies. They'd been towing some guy around in a sleigh. <laughs> <laughs> no Christmas this year. Uh, three more carcasses of reindeer found later in the month tested positive for rabies. More reindeer and a second fox later on. A, a veritable outbreak of rabies. And they have a nice table here of all the table, all the in animals. Two foxes and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight reindeer. Eight reindeer, yes. Is so that how many? All, uh, that's how many Santa has. Eight. Yes. Oh wow. Yes. This all happens in. Uh, they say okay. The population of this town is twenty five hundred. Right. This the, all the whole, the whole archipelago is twenty five hundred. The two thousand of them are in Long Yerpian, and then okay. the, most of the rest are at a coal mine that's right near there. This all happens in the context of what appears to be an annual reindeer hunt. Right. That's right. Where right, and got... I, I love this. Groups of children from daycares and schools also participated in the hunt, <laughs> uh, and in several cases were allowed to touch the animals after they were shot. So this is a whole whole community activity to go out and and hunt reindeer. They got two to three hundred hunters participating in this hunt, in which approximately two hundred reindeer were killed. I wonder. I guess they're culling the herd or something like that. I don't know. Um, right, and I I was just. Uh, um, Noticed this uh, this line. Groups of children from daycares and schools also participated in the hunt, and in several cases were allowed to touch the animals after they were shot. Right. So I think this is a whole kind of community activity. Um, right. And and they 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 apparently the government knows the names. They you got to register for this hunt, so right. they know yeah. everybody. Uh, and they hunters are asked to separate the mandible from the reindeer carcass and send it to the governor's office. <laughs> Okay, I guess to keep a tally on what's going on. The procedure may expose, uh, may involve exposure to the animal's oral cavity, saliva, and spinal cord. Um, and so all this is going on, and then what? The woman gets attacked by a dog, a dog, or by a fox. The dog right. later kills the fox. They figure out the fox and two of the reindeer were rabid. Yeah. I can imagine that that would create oh yeah many people had already con by the time it happened many people had already consumed cooked reindeer meat obtained during a hunting period hunting period and many still have meat in their freezer right right so if i were involved in this and this rabies thing came up i'd feel uncomfortable right and your you know maybe your kid went on one of these hunts and you, you now you've had a reindeer dinner a couple of nights and right what's going on with this rabies thing right. yeah because and if you got the meat in your freezer and you don't Suspect that it has rabies virus. You know, you take it out. You got cuts on your hand. You could get. You're not going to get it by eating it, but you could get it on your hands and into a cut, right? And it's not like anybody's stupid about this. The government actually recommends rabies vaccinations for people who are going to participate in the hunt. Right. 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 They recommend it for anybody who's hunting or might have contact with wild right. animals, which actually is that's a pretty good idea. That's just, a pretty good idea. Just worldwide, if you're hunting or expecting contact with wild animals, you, you probably ought to get the vaccine. That makes sense. I, I have to go back to this sending the carcass. So when you, hit, when you kill a reindeer, you're supposed to cut the head off, and uh, set, cut the mandible off, and send it to the governor's office. Now, right. I can just see sending a reindeer jaw to my governor here. <laughs> In New Jersey, our governor is Chris Christie, right? This guy who was thinking of running for president. Can you as imagine? long as you don't send him a horse head. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> this is weird. I guess it's a different part of the world. Well, and for the governor's office um, would mean whoever they is in charge of the of the hunt within the governor's office, and we're talking about a um, a place that has two thousand people. Yeah, yes, in. of course, quite different. It's, it's so. just it's just funny, right? And they, I, I assume the logic of sending the lower jaw, the mandible, um, is that you can tell a lot about an animal from that. Right. Yep. Look at yep. tooth wear patterns and the size. You can get the age and diet right. and all that. Right. Governor Schwarzenegger, we have a jaw here for you today. Right. Okay. Yes. 
Well, it turns out that rabies is endemic in the Arctic. Now, this I did not know. I didn't either. And there have been a lot of outbreaks, Canada, Russia, Greenland. They've had rabies, known rabies in Svalbard since 1980. It's in these foxes, these Arctic foxes. From 1980 to 1999, 25 animals diagnosed with rabies, including three reindeer. So when you hunt, they want you to be careful, and they would they would recommend immunization, but it turns out that most of the hunters don't do that. Uh, they don't they're not immunized beforehand. Uh, there aren't that many of them. You would think it could be done. Uh, the virus is the the Arctic fox is the reservoir or the host of the virus. Uh, but there's an interesting discussion here. It's a, it's a relatively low-density population, and it's not known how the virus is maintained in those animals. Well, they have to get together sometime, otherwise you'd run out of Arctic foxes. That's right. It could be frozen somewhere. Yeah. It could be excreted for long long times, et cetera. And I don't, know, I don't know what eats them or what eats them when they die. or um, So there's, there's other stuff up in that area that might be. I, I don't think there are a whole lot of Arctic bats, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I don't know much about it, but I would guess not. Uh, these viruses, of course, these are rabies viruses. They are enveloped, negative-stranded RNA viruses, and they are generally transmitted by the bite or the saliva, so the virus replicates in the brain, the central nervous system, and it comes out in the saliva of rabid animals. So you'll be bitten by one, you acquire it. If you contact their saliva and it, it gets into a cut on you, it can also enter that way. So mainly saliva in a bite. Now, they make an interesting claim here, and if it were Wikipedia, I would add a little citation needed bracket afterward. They say mainland Norway continues to be free of rabies. Yeah, that really surprised me. I just looked up, I just put a link in the notes there, guys, for a World Health Organization map from, it's old, 1998, that shows the distribution of rabies worldwide. Okay? And they do, they do indeed say that actually all of Scandinavia according to this, is rabies-free, hmm. as is apparently Australia. Uh, it looks like Japan. Uh, come hmm. on, geez, it looks like Spain and Iberia. If I and they have, a right. separate, they have a separate color on the map for no information, so rabies right. absent must mean that somebody has looked. Somebody's reported. Italy, Spain, Portugal, Great Britain, Ireland... Uh, that's that's more rabies absent than I would have predicted. I would have thought there would have been more of a distribution. That oh oh this is okay. I I now oh this is animals, and and I now do not believe this because if you look over in Southeast Asia, um, look at New Guinea. Uh, I guess this is what is this island just north of Australia? It's um. Is that New Zealand? No, no, no. no, it's no, no. In the south. Just north. Is that no, New Guinea, Papua New Guinea? I believe so. Yeah, the one that's so. divided in half between right. two different countries, yes. but it's an right. island. Okay. Ah, okay. They got it. Okay. On. Left yeah. half has rabies in most areas. Right half has right. rabies absent. Right. That can't be right. That can't be right. That's a that's an island that's um, if I'm if I recall correctly, it's dense jungle. Right. And the virus is not going to respect a border like that. Uh, yeah, it, there's a similar thing going on in Africa. I can't name the countries there. But there's oh, a, yeah. Is that, um, is that Egypt? No, I don't think so. Is Egypt is to the right of that? Yeah, no. there's one, but you're right. North Africa, you've got a rabies absent next to one with rabies in most areas and one in, in limited areas. Uh, so there's uh, uh, some of these places may actually be rabies-free. So if I'm not mistaken, the U.K. is rabies-free. I think that's... That may actually be true, but some of this is going to be uh, reporting issues. And actually, same thing in Scandinavia. Right. It abuts, it abuts Russia. Right. And the land masses come right together, and you've got rabies in most areas in Russia, according to the WHO, and zero rabies in Scandinavia. And then you've got rabies up in, the, up in these islands that we're talking right. about in Svalbard, and I believe a lot of that water is frozen during the winter. Um. Yeah, I find I find these statistics. I'm I'm not going to say that they're 
wrong, but just that they're pretty shocking if true. We we, we likely have reporting issues. Yes. Are, this is an old. Um, it's map an old map. Well. Is there but a, is there a newer one? Do you know? Uh, that's just what I came up with all of a sudden. Yeah. Okay. You know, on a 90, quick search. Ninety-eight. Um, but uh, uh, rabies. There's a lot of it around. Yeah. yeah. And it's not going away anytime soon. And as there's a lot of it in the U.S. Now we're talking about rabies in animals. Right. There's a lot of right. it in yes. the U.S. Well, in particular, India has a big problem. There are lots of uh, wild dogs running around. Yeah. So the interesting, yeah, the interesting thing is that in in uh, countries in countries developed countries where they have a good uh, animal vaccination program, uh, the reservoir for rabies is wild animals: skunks, foxes, raccoons, yeah. bats. Yeah. Right. Uh, but in uh, developing nations where the animal control is not great, the uh, it's all in dogs. That's the right. big problem. So the concern here was not only these individuals who'd been licked uh, by the dog, and the dog was put in quarantine and seems to be okay, um, but the people who had the meat in their freezers, they could acquire the virus by when they were cooking it, handling the meat, not by eating again, but by handling right. it. So they, they instituted an immunization schedule uh, for uh, people who had been involved in the hunt, and they gave them uh, some rabies immunoglobulin, some antibody against the virus, plus uh, the vaccine. Right, so, so people, is, who, people who got bitten or scratched or, or had direct contact with a really clear transmission route got the immunoglobulin plus the vaccine. Right. And people who just had these sort of uh, secondary maybe type exposures got licked by the dog that ate the fox or, or, or that killed the fox or, or just were cutting the jaw off a reindeer, um, they just got the vaccine. Yeah, basically, if you can identify some sort of puncture wound where the virus might have gone in, then you uh, inject the uh, immunoglobulin in there, hoping it'll locally uh, uh, attack the virus, and then right. give them the vaccine on top of that. But if you can't identify uh, a site like that, there's no point. And now, a total of, they say a total of 280 people got various types of post-exposure prophylaxis, either the immunoglobulin and vaccine or just vaccine. Um, so that's, uh, that's a little over 10% of the population. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, it's worth mentioning that, uh, rabies is unusual in this, uh, uh, in this f way that you can actually give vaccine after exposure to the virus. Right. And, and the reason for this is that it, uh, it has a, a very long incubation period. And the incubation period can be, I suppose, as short as a couple of weeks or a month, but that's rare. It's usually a month or two and can be long as a year or even longer. And what, the, what happens is that the virus replicates a little bit locally in the muscle where, the, where it first goes in, where the bite occurs. And then it travels up neurons to the brain and you don't actually see symptoms until it's starting to replicate in the brain. And by the time you see symptoms, it's too late. You're dead. Right. Uh, and it also then travels from the brain down to the salivary glands and some other organs. But the minute you start to see uh, symptoms in the brain, it's too late. So if you, and, and it's virtually 100% fatal. Um, so if there's any exposure to the virus where you think you might be infected, it makes sense. Since it takes so long, you can do this post-exposure uh, vaccination, okay? So if you feel like you're at risk for this thing, it makes sense uh, giving the vaccine because if you're wrong, you're dead. Right. This On the other hand, you, you won't get it from eating cooked meat from an animal. No. Mm -hmm. and, That's right. and you won't get it from, say, the, the feces or urine of an infected animal. Right. Right. So in a place like this where there's contact regularly between people and these wild animals, you should immunize them when, if the virus is endemic, they should be immunized, especially when you have this reindeer hunt every year, they should immunize them. Yeah, I well, think, well, people should follow the recommendation. If you're, right. if you're a hunter, then you should get the shots. Now, another thing they could do, which is not mentioned here, is that they, they could try to immunize the wild animals. Yes. They could right. drop bait laced with vaccine 
of various sorts, which is done in a number of countries, and we've talked about mm -hmm. uh, yep. before. But and that's in, pretty effective. Yeah, but in this case, the scale of the territory yeah, it's big, right? would be a big deterrent to doing that. You've got these Arctic foxes that are very, very dispersed carnivores hunting across this huge, huge area. Um, and you'd have to distribute baits out there and probably quite a lot of them to make sure that some of them got eaten. And I think it'd be a huge operation when you could just focus locally instead. May I ask, why do people live on this uh, archipelago? There's stuff there. There's um, uh, Originally, it was coal mining. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I gather there's still uh, at least one active mine there. And then there's also... Um, uh, I, I browsed around a little bit and found that there's some sort of um, satellite tracking operation there that uh, that maintains satellites because they've got a clear view being near the pole. They've got a clear view of polar orbiting satellites. <laughs> there's a web page on Norway. <laughs> visit visit Norway.com called the Svalbard Islands. <laughs> it's, and it says, what to do in Svalbard? Shopping in Svalbard, <laughs> and then eating and nightlife in Svalbard. Well, and you look at pictures of this town, and the house, there's a row of houses, and then there's a, essentially one big building, I think, and that's downtown. Hmm. And so those shops and everything are in this one area. It's interesting. Wow. And Apparently, there's also uh, the seed bank, right? Yes, there's the Svalbard Global Seed Bank that they're, I guess, I guess that's open now. Um, and uh, the idea is to store seeds of, of all of the important plants of the world um, in case something bad happens to the, to the plants out in the wild, you know, the food plants that we use and all that. Um, we'd have an archive of, of seeds of them. Huh. The bill, and Svalbard is, is a sensible place. It's geologically yeah. stable. Um, you don't have to pay for refrigeration, right? And uh, <laughs> and so they've they've built this or uh, they're building this big vault there to store yeah, this, the world's. This yeah. wiki page that you found has a diagram of it and everything. It's very yeah. cool. Well, there you go. If you're planning a vacation, <laughs> check out Svalbard. But, but just get a rabies immunization. Get rabies first. If you're going right. to go hunting. Yeah, if you're going to go they, on the reindeer hunt. Uh, they they conclude that, you know, uh, you know, their main conclusion here is that you ought to get vaccinated if you're going to do this. Yep. Makes yep. sense. Absolutely. Well, they've already vaccinated a lot of people that were involved in it uh, this year. So yes. they won't have many left over next year. Nobody got sick. Right. Well, of course, yes. it's uh, when this was, was this? September, and this is October. Recent, so recent, yeah. September. Yeah. We'll have to it's wait a bit. Yeah. Night. Yeah. We'll keep but an eye it'll out. Be all right. mm. There's a, actually, despite what something like seven to ten thousand reports of rabid animals a year in the U.S., there's only one or two cases of rabies a year. Yeah. So these uh, these precautions, the uh, ability to do the post-exposure uh, mm. prophylaxis. First of all, the actual attacks by rabid animals probably aren't all that frequent. But the post-exposure prophylaxis is, uh, is very effective. So you can, this is something you can deal with. Of course, we have rabid raccoons here in Central Park, New York City. You do. Yeah, but uh, no, no incidents of transmission yet, at least in recent history. But they are uh, in many places. You have to be careful. Okay, that is our first paper. Our second story was suggested by Dirk, who said, uh, sent us this paper and wrote, A prion that makes you go antiviral. It's the first time prion aggregation is shown to be an intrinsic part of a signal transduction chain, further underlines the role of mitochondria in innate antiviral responses. Thanks for the many hours of podcasting. So we took up Dirk's suggestion and took this paper, which was published in Cell. It's called MAVS, forms functional prion-like aggregates to activate and propagate antiviral innate immune responses. This was the first author, who in the last one, Chen, who is at the University of Texas in Dallas, and Chen's lab is well known for working 
on this protein. One of the one of the co-discoverers of MAVs, which also has many other names, including IPS1, Visa, and Cardiff. Visa, I like that one. Yeah. Credit card protein. <laughs> now, this paper involves two things, which we have talked about a little bit here on TWIV. Uh, one of them is innate immunity, and the other is prions. Puts them both together. So right. let's, talk, let's talk a little bit about innate immune defenses. So this protein is involved in the sensing of uh, viruses as foreign. And let me give you an example of what happens here when, say, an RNA virus infects a cell. Its genome is sensed as foreign in the cytoplasm of the cell by the innate immune defenses. These are defenses that are on all the time in contrast to adaptive defenses, which have to develop over uh, 7 to 14 days. So there are proteins in the cytoplasm. They're called RIGI or MDA5. They are able to sense RNA as foreign. So, for example, uh, viral RNA typically is either double-stranded or has a 5' prime pho- triphosphate, and these are detected as foreign by these RIGI-like proteins. Right. That the uh, RIGI proteins <clears throat> see features on the RNA that's not common to cellular RNA. Right. So the cellular so RNAs they, are there, like mRNAs, they're not detected. But right. So they know this stuff is bad. It's not right. So the, when RIGI and MDA5 detect these proteins, they become activated and they bind to this MAVS protein. We'll call it MAVS for the purpose of this discussion. Uh, and MAVS is, is located in the outer membrane of the mitochondrion. Right? So it's stuck in the outer mitochondrial membrane. And so Rig I, when bound to a viral RNA, binds this MAVS protein, and that initiates a whole pathway of various events, including phosphorylation and activation. It's a very big signaling pathway, which leads to the phosphorylation of a couple of proteins called transcription factors, and those go in the nucleus and turn on the synthesis of cytokines, including interferons. Right. So this is a generic mechanism that the cell uses for a whole bunch of different viral attacks. Right. right. And it's not doesn't necessarily discriminate one virus from another, and it has no memory of That's what's right. happened. This distinguishes yeah. it from the adaptive immune response, which actually uh, sees a virus and, and ultimately effectively says, oh... This is flu, and I'm going to remember this so that next time it comes around, I'm going to squash it earlier. All right? right. Innate this immunity is, says, hey, this looks kind of infectious. Let's get rid of us. Right. And this is the, uh, there's a wave of this stuff that happens when you get infected. The uh, innate response is the first thing that happens. And in fact, the, some of the cytokines uh, turn on the adaptive response, say, hey, we got a problem here, okay? And the adaptive response is, is recruited to the uh, site of infection. And then the adaptive response takes over. Right. And this, and is, the, uh, this is quick. <clears throat> this happens within minutes of infection. Right. Yeah. right. And the, the cytokines and stuff that are made basically go out and not only recruit a bunch of uh, other immune cells and the adaptive response to the site and turn all that on, but they uh, turn on this antiviral response in the neighboring cells as well. So there's this wave of warning and protection that goes out. And by the way, when you, you know, you get the flu or something like that and you feel fever, malaise, you just drug out and awful, that's mostly this innate re- immune response going off. Yep. The uh, interferon. When I start feeling like that, I say, "Ah, great, make an interferon." Everything, everything's working. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's that's the body's <laughs> bombing campaign before they deploy the snipers. That's right. Okay, so in this paper, they're studying this MAVS protein. Remember, it's a mitochondrial outer membrane of the mitochondrial bound protein. It has to be there for it to be active. If you take MAVS out of the mitochondria, it doesn't work. To to participate in this signaling pathway leading to the production of these uh, cytokines. Now, the one previous um, observation that they have made uh, before is that uh, the um, Rig I protein seems to be um, it seems to be important for this to bind what are called polyubiquitin chains. 
All right, the whole signaling pathway depends on rig eye interacting with polyubiquitin. Now, ubiquitin is a smallish protein. I think it's about 8K mm-hmm. in size, which um, has a variety of functions in cells. It, it can be attached to proteins to signal them to be degraded, for example. But in other cases, it's needed for the activity of protein. And they, you can make chains of ubiquitin. They're called polyubiquitin. And you need those for rig eye to be active. So if rig eye will sense RNA, but unless it's bound to these polyubiquitin chains, it doesn't turn on the subsequent uh, cytokine response that we've been talking about. So they're trying to figure that out. Why is that? And they began looking at MAVs, and that's that's where the story begins. They and they and they have this um, the cell free system that they use yeah. to study it. So they're using most of the work is done here in in these cell extracts. So they've simplified the system in order to look at this thing. Yeah, that makes it easy because you can add things readily and take things right. away from it. So should we review prions too as part of the introduction to this? Yeah, we could do that. <clears throat> have we talked about prions before? Yeah, wasting. Uh, wasting yeah, ah, that's Wasting right. what does. <laughs> Wasting away again, and no. <laughs> Chronic wasting disease. Chronic wasting disease of cervids. Yep. How is the innate response and rack and yellow similar? Oh. Uh-oh. They both have no memory. <laughs> not, not so good. Want me to cut it out? Uh, no. You, no, you keep it there. You keep I have, it there. I have I mean, some it's a memory. nice try. I have some memory. I'm not Somebody sure might the, think it's funny. I'm not the jokester, anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, we have talked about prions quite a bit here. Uh, okay, this, and uh, we've done the basic stuff, but we can review it again. Prions well, are proteins yeah. that uh, everyone probably knows that they are associated with uh, um, with wasting diseases, not only in cervids but also in people. Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease and a variety of other um, TSEs. They're and called. mad cow disease in cattle. Mad cow disease was the one was the one that most people be familiar with. Right. Mad cow, yeah. So these are proteins. Right. So these, these these are proteins that. Um, they they assume a particular conformation and then they stimulate other proteins to assume that same conformation. And in the case of the these diseases, you get these um, these sort of filaments of protein that stick together and gum things up. Right. Transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. So they spongiform don't they don't describes- carry they don't carry DNA or RNA. Yes, it's just the protein propagates its shape, and that's the disease. So it's actually a, a, a protein that we all have, the prion protein. Right. And it gets somehow it gets misfolded, and then that misfolded protein propagates itself among your normals. It turns right. your normal proteins into misfolded ones, and you develop these uh, encephalopathies, which are yeah. really bad neurological diseases and pretty much yeah. all fatal. And it works like a, like a seed crystal or a catalyst. That's a good. That's a good analogy. A seed crystal. So, a, a bad protein interacts with a good protein and makes that change shape into a bad protein, and on and on and on. Yeah. And it right. propagates. Yeah. And they and they all stick together in this filament. And this paper is a wonderful demonstration of it. It's 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 just beautiful. If you take a pot of normal prion protein and you add a little bit of the misfolded one, it propagates that misfolding, right. which is and an so, amazing thing, which we really don't understand. Yeah. And so biologically, they behave as if they're infectious because if you, uh, in the in the disease forms of these, because if you acquire one of these like uh, Creutzfeldt-Jakob or Kuru proteins, it um, changes your normal proteins and you get a disease. So that that looks like it's infectious, but it's not. It's not in the same. No nucleic acid involved or anything like that. Right. Right. So in this protein, they're in, they're studying uh, infection with Sendai virus. A an RNA virus, negative stranded, that is a really good inducer of interferon. So a lot of people use it for these kinds of studies. And they find, they're looking at MAVs in a variety of ways, and they find these huge aggregates of the protein. One way you can do this is by uh, separating the protein on a sucrose gradient, for example, and then you can run it on a gel, and you can see, wow, the protein is running much higher than it should be. Um, so that's aggregates, much larger than a 26S proteasome, which is a very, very big complex uh, that's present in the cell. And these aggregates are, are self-propagating or self-perpetuating? These are self-perpetuating. Um, we, we, they can add 
a little bit of the aggregate to right. fresh cells, and they will get a lot of it out so of it. So they're, they're they, prion-like. Prion-like. They actually quantify it as a number. If you add one nanogram of misfolded MAVs or aggregated MAVs, it can convert 16 nanograms of uh, normal MAVs. It's quite interesting. So um, let's see. This paper is full of data. There's just a, an enormous amount of work here, and it's yes. just beautiful. It's just beautiful. It's so well done. Now, one thing I thought was very interesting, there's an inhibitor called gildenomycin. So one of the target proteins of this pathway in which MAVS is a member is the phosphorylation of a protein called IRF3. And when that gets phosphorylated, it goes in the nucleus and turns on the synthesis of uh, interferons and other cytokines. And it's been known for a while that galdanamycin inhibits phosphorylation of IRF3. It turns out the way this drug works, it blocks these aggregates. Okay, so when you add galdanamycin to cells, you don't find these aggregates. So they conclude that the mechanism is that you block the aggregates and that you need these aggregates for getting this signaling pathway from rig eye detecting RNA to making interferons. Right. Uh, let's see, what else? Well, what I really like is this, uh, the electron micrographs of this thing. So they are able to yes. separate by uh, a sizing column, uh, yes. uh, gel filtration. They're able to separate the aggregated forms of this from the non-aggregated forms, and they do negative staining electron microscopy on uh, both the aggregated and the non-aggregated forms. And the aggregates are these uh, wonderful filaments that are formed, and the mm -hmm. non-aggregated ones are these uh, little blobs, and it's just, to me, the transformation is just striking, and they show very clearly that all of the biochemical activities are associated with the aggregated form and not the non-aggregated right. form. And the, so, the aggregated form is sum sumo MEVs, right? Well, that's, they, they cloned, what they did was they actually uh, purif they uh, cloned this stuff in E. coli, because uh, they wanted a, a, a recombinant form that they could deal with. Yeah. Uh, and, but it, it's such a, um, a difficult protein to work with that they had to trim it down. They had to throw away some domains that were not necessary for the activities, and then they had to uh, couple it to a protein called SUMO, which is one of these sort of chaperone-like proteins right. uh, from eukaryotic cells. Uh, and so the recombinant form they call SUMO MAVs. Right. Yeah, it was kind of a fortuitous finding that this made it soluble so they could mm -hmm. study it. Yeah, which, which highlights, highlights, I mean, the reason I brought that up is it, it highlights how hard this stuff is. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's every every one of these experiments was. This was not something you dash off in an afternoon. No. Nope. So yes, they do these these studies as as Alan mentioned, where they add uh, a little bit of these fibrils to solution, and they watch the conversion of everything else. So they say um, it's uh, it's like a prion a prion like conformational switch. Yeah. You add one protein, it converts the others, and the fibers that. Rich mentioned that they see by EM are very much like the prion protein fibrils that you see as they well. They even have a nice EM that compares the two side by side. Yep. Yeah. The MAVs and the prion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have that in there as a control. It's very nice. So they do a lot of experiments showing that you need to have the mitochondria uh, for this to happen, for the whole signaling to occur. You need the aggregation. They have this wonderful model in the end where you have your, your rig eye detecting viral RNA uh, and then it becomes associated with you polyubiquitin, and that is needed to bind the MAVS protein on the mitochondria and then to stimulate its association into these uh, multi-MERS or, or uh, high molecular weight assemblies. And then after that, those assemblies propagate that change to the other MAVS proteins, and right. that amplifies the signal. Right. 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 And that recruits... That in the aggregated form, it recruits a couple of other signaling molecules, which then ultimately uh, propagate the signal to IRF3 and turn on the interferon yeah. response. And this is all inst and this is not causing a disease. This is all in the service of stopping a disease. Yeah. Right. So the way they say it is that you have a small, 
you have a little bit of viral RNA present, and then it gets amplified by this uh, aggregation of MAVs. You have a very rapid propagation of these aggregates, which amplifies the signal, and it makes sense because you're responding very quickly to an infection. Right. So one thing that's always puzzled me about some of this stuff uh, is why is this happening on mitochondria? Yeah. You know? There's yeah. uh, there's a lot of apoptosis functions that involve mitochondrial membrane proteins uh, or even s like cytochrome C from the inside of mitochondria. And uh, I don't, I, I'm wondering if there's, I suppose this is a biological why question. We're not supposed to ask that, right? Well, there's no answer. Right, because right. why, why did mitochondria become specialized for, for, for these death functions? Right. In a way, it kind of makes sense because they are the respiration center. Right. And, and so uh, maybe that makes sense. I can't quite make the connection. Uh, completely, but or I've it may just it, it may just have been that in the early case of indigestion that led to the the mitochondria getting into a eukaryotic cell, um, they just happened to bring in proteins that were useful for this sort of thing. They the were they were potentially useful for this sort of thing. The other thing that strikes me about this is that although it's really cool and you know elegant and it's in particular with the amplification because of the association, it's one of these pathways is just enormously baroque. Yes. I, 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 I just, if I were going to do it, I wouldn't do it this way. I, <laughs> okay. Yet it, another it, argument it, against intelligent design. Right? Exactly. This is something that was built by a bureaucracy. Yes. All right. It's just kind of, well, we'll try this. No, 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 no. Don't do that. <laughs> try this. And wow, I got here first. You know, Evo evolution is generally additive. Yeah. Well, there is a reason it's why it's complicated, right? There must be, and we just don't know it. Well, I don't know about that. I, there's a reason. That, I think the reason that it got complicated was that it's easier for evolution to add functions than to take them away. That makes sense to me. And then the reason it persists is because it's good enough. Yeah, it works. It works I mean, okay. look, you look at this pathway, you have you know, 15, 20 different steps. Yeah. My view is that makes it flexible. You can regulate it in various ways that maybe we don't know about. But it's, but it's not, necessar not necessarily true that it is regulated at all of those levels. Well, we don't know. There's a tremendous amount of redundancy in biology. There's, it's also the, <clears throat> also the case that at each of these steps, there's an opportunity for amplification. Yes, and so, but, but so, each of those steps also brings up an opportunity for error. So in general, in biology, are all pathways complex? No, I don't think so. To, to name a pathway where you have one step and that's it. Hmm. Now you're really putting us on the spot. Well, I don't mean to trip you up, but I just want to know if, you know, you, you, it's an interesting idea that you have there about the way this evolved. You would think that would apply to all pathways. But I suspect there are simpler ones than this. For sure there are. Uh, yeah, well, I'm trying to think of uh, in... Um... There might be simpler ones that accomplish simpler things. Well, this is turning on a, a set of proteins, right, which is relatively simple. I mean, if you no. look at the way the interferons turn on interferon-stimulated genes, that's far less complex. You yeah. have a receptor which activates uh, a few proteins by phosphorylation. They go in the nucleus. And here you have all this intervening stuff. And, but you can build it simpler, and the interferon-stimulated pathway shows that. Right. So this is just uh, evolution got out of hand. It got out of control. But you I think so. You don't need it this way, right? That's what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we obviously we don't have enough information to say for sure, but I I think there are plenty of structures in biology that you can look at and say, you know, that is not the most efficient way to do things. Right. It would be interesting to look back uh, and see in other organisms what this pathway looks like. Mm -hmm. how, yeah. it if it, how has it evolved? Is it simpler or as complex? I don't know that that's been done. These are mostly done in mammalian uh, systems. Yeah, and and I, think, I think what we're looking at here is the discovery of, of another signal amplification strategy. You know, you have these complex phosphorylation cascades, for example, where a phosphorylates B, phosphorylates C, and you get down to Y phosphorylates Z that actually does the work. 
And as as Rich said, that provides a lot of room for amplification. Uh, it provides um, room for for more input and other signals to regulate it. Um, this this type of aggregation as a signal propagator could be another strategy for doing the same thing because it's a way to amplify a signal. Yeah. Now it's worth it's worth mentioning at this point that prions have previously been shown not necessarily to be pathogenic. So the most right. first ones discovered were the prions that cause disease. But in yeast and other organisms, it's been shown that there are many genes with prion-like properties similar right. to MAVs that we have here. And these are proteins that have memories, just like this one. They can make another protein fold in the same way. And it's thought that, in general, they allow an organism to switch between different states. So in yeast, for example, for rapid adaptation to some stress, a protein could quickly uh, give rise to other proteins like it and allow the, the yeast to do that. Mm. Right. Now, the, the person who has discovered that is Susan Lindquist. Yes. Uh, and there are lots of wonderful papers that she's written about this in yeast. And our friend Mark Pelletier over at Futures in Biotech has two different podcasts with her, which we'll link to. Now the um, the other interesting thing here to me is these these normal biological processes, not the pathogenic ones, but the normal ones, obviously have to be reversible. Um, so you you activate MAVs and it does these huge aggregates in the cell, or or maybe it does you know something to propagate the signal like that, um, hmm. and and that activates innate immunity, and then after you've done that, you need to shut this thing down. Mm -hmm. And they, the authors point out in the paper it would be interesting to investigate how cells resolve these mitochondrial aggregates. And I, I think that's a really interesting thing to ask, particularly since we have these pathogenic prion diseases that we might want to be able to treat. Right, and these, uh, these aggregates are notoriously uh, resistant to all sorts of insults. Like the way you isolate prions is to take a, a cell lysate and basically boil it in SDS and treat it with proteases and do all sorts of nasty things to it. And the only thing that's left is prions. Right. So, so getting rid of this stuff is, is, is a problem, at least in a test tube. Yeah. It, and, and this is not just um, a, a sort of a rare freakish disease type of thing, like creutzfeldt jakob doesn't, doesn't affect a whole lot of people. Um, but uh, you look at diseases like Alzheimer's disease, um, you have these filaments forming in the brain, and there's some debate about whether those are the main pathogenic mechanism, but the fact is they, they occur. You get these amyloid aggregates. Um, so it's another case where you have aggregates forming as part of a pathogenic process. If we can figure out how these MAVs reverse their aggregation, we might be able to get at some mm -hmm. of those problems yeah. too. Uh, in yeast, there are known mechanisms for uh, removing the prions when they're no okay. longer needed, and maybe we can get cues from that mm -hmm. as well. Because, yeah, in, in the diseases in, in these encephalopathies, they don't go away. That's part of the problem. Right. And that is something we don't know about MAVs. It's a good point. Yeah. This reminds me of the history of oncogenes, where we discovered viral oncogenes, viruses that caused caused cancer, and they carried genes that did that, identified the genes, and then it turned out that those were uh, actually cellular genes that had been copped by the viruses and uh, perhaps mutated in a fashion that uh, caused the problem. And then you look at the cellular genes and you find out that these are genes that are uh, critical for normal cellular growth control. So similarly, we first learn about prions as disease agents uh, gone bad, and then you have a closer look and you find out that they're normal cellular proteins that yep, sure. uh, have a number of regulatory processes in the cells. You know, right. Rich, I, I'm starting to feel the same way about viruses. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they were first discovered uh. and studied because they cause disease, right? right? First in plants and then in animals. But... I'm beginning to think they're just another way for diversity to emerge. Yeah, as a matter of yeah. fact, one of the picks this week or 
one of the letters has to do with this, the notion of viruses driving evolution, for example. Yep. You know, something goes wrong now and then they cause disease, but for them, I bet in the end we're going to see for the most part mm. uh, most of the viruses aren't, aren't all that bad. Right. In which case we will have to change the tagline for TWIF, but by then it'll be too late. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's cool paper. Very uh, I, did, I did want to point out one more thing. Yes, um, which is the the viruses, of course, have already figured out that this MAV system is bad news for them. Mm-hmm. Um, so they the authors mentioned in the paper hepatitis C virus. Ah, uh, right. Uses its protease to chop this MAVs off the mitochondrial membrane so it can't right. aggregate. Right. Yep. Yep. And now we know why. Right. Very cool. <laughs> yep. And in fact, in my laboratory, we have shown. A similar thing happens with polio and rhinovirus-infected cells. Yeah. They have proteases. They encode proteases, which cleave MAVs. The cool thing is they also cleave Rig I, which is the sensor upstream, and MDA5, the other cytoplasmic sensor. So they really trash this whole pathway. Cool. Cool. Very interesting. So thanks, Dirk, for a great suggestion, and congratulations to the authors on this paper. It's a beautiful yes. paper. Yes, very nicely done. Yeah, this fellow was here last Wednesday giving a seminar. Oh, is that right? Yeah, but I was in Princeton giving a lecture for Lynn Enquist, <laughs> so I missed it, but he must have been terrific, right? Probably talked about this. All right, let's do a few emails. Over on facebook.com slash This Week in Virology, Dylan wrote... Greatest podcast ever, along with Twim and Twip. I just wanted to mention that. Thank you, Dylan. Aw, shucks. Greatest podcast ever. Great. Also, similar t comments over on iTunes. A lot of people really like them, so thanks. Now, last week, you remember, we talked about viruses in the effluence of society. Yes. We had a few questions. I sent them over to Jim Peepas, who's one of the co-authors on that paper, and he had some an answers. So one, the geographic breakdown, which we lamented that they hadn't separated out the viruses into three different locations. The data can be broken down by location if you download table S2. It is in the last column. We didn't discuss the data by location because for this paper, we took a single sample from each site. Thus, this is a snapshot of viral diversity at the moment the sample was taken. As we indicate in equation one, the probability of detecting a given virus is dictated by a number of time-dependent variables. For example, climate or time of season might be expected to impact the number of a specific type of virus present. We felt that to make conclusions about location, we would need to collect many more samples under a number of different conditions. We are doing this now. All right, so there you go. Yeah. Two, I'm not sure why we didn't see any negative strand RNA viruses or poliovirus. There are three possibilities that we are testing. One is that the method of virion enrichment, in this case flocculation, did not capture these particular viruses. The second is that they are present below our limits of detection. That is, we need to sequence deeper. We know that there are viruses present in the samples detected by PCR that we do not detect by sequencing. The final, final formal possibility is that these viruses are not present in our samples. I will let you know what we find. And three, how many species of hosts? The number eight, 1.8 million does include bacteria, but clearly this is a serious underestimate. I, too, have seen that this number is likely to be rise to 8 million, but I have not seen this published in a journal yet. We decided to go with the published number. I agree with you that there are many more bacterial species that await discovery, and that means many, many, many more viruses. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Thanks, Jim. That's good. Thank Clarify you. Clarify some of that stuff. Next one is from Michael, who writes, In TWIV 151 at about 5440, Alan says that the general lifestyle of macrophages, which do kind of make a living this way, they go around eating stuff that's not supposed to be in the bloodstream. I couldn't help but catch this error. Alan, it was my understanding from my basic immunology course that macrophages are monocytes while in circulation, and it is not until they have left the bloodstream into tissues that they mature into macrophages. That was my understanding from my immunology course, too, which was a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> P.S. Alan, I greatly enjoy your input as a writer. Cool. Does that Just mean not, as, not as an immunologist. <laughs> <laughs> it's a funny comment. So, yeah, yeah, I screwed that up. 
Okay, thank but you, the Michael. But basic, the basic idea is, is the same. The yeah. macrophages go around and they eat stuff that isn't supposed to be in there. Yeah, we often um, use macrophages very liberally. Yes. Yeah. But this is what we mean. But we I, get be, all these, I get all these immune cells all mixed up. We should be you know? clearer. It's complicated. There are so darn many of them. All right, the next one is from Jamie. This is in response to also something we talked about last time. We had a question from someone about whether you could get infections from a soccer pitch, which is a field on which you play soccer or football, depending on where you're from. <laughs> Hello, gentlemen and Alan. <clears throat> <clears throat> wow. <laughs> Ooh, no, I think you're a gentleman. I wanted to bring to your attention the numerous dangers of pitches or fields, especially ones that aren't as well kept as the professionals. My fiance plays rugby. The field is not only home to rugby games, but it serves as a temporary home to plenty of wildlife. By wildlife, I mean Canada geese. The field sees many flocks of geese who are not potty trained. The public also allows their canine companions to run and excrete on the field. Our one home game last fall after extensive rain, the field was very soft. Unfortunately, the field had a hidden slab of concrete about four inches below the surface. My fiancé launched himself to tackle his opponent, and his knee sank more than four inches right at the corner of that concrete slab. You're allowed to tackle people in soccer? Yeah, yeah rugby. I, I, think, rugby. I think the only rule is you can't kill them if they don't this, have the this ball. This is rugby, dude. This is rugby. This is rugby. Sorry. Uh, rugby, right. Sparing the gory details, he was taken by ambulance to hospital where the emergency department decided the wound was too deep to be cleaned while he was conscious. The doctor that performed his initial surgery cultured the wound and gave him IV antibiotics overnight. The laceration was stapled, shut, no drain, and the bandage was instructed to be removed in five days. When the bandages were removed, the area was swollen, tender, and red coloration extended up his thigh almost to his groin. By the next day, my fiancé had a high fever and went to the doctor's office where the original doctor's partner sent him immediately back to hospital. Original cultures were never finished. Secondary cultures showed gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, and the majority of what was cultured came from fecal material. IV antibiotics were not enough to knock out the infection. He was subjected to four more surgeries, lost part of his patella, stayed another 10 days in hospital. He will never be without pain in that knee again, not because of the accident, but because of the secondary infection. How? I know this would be more appropriate for TWIM, but I wanted to let the TWIV team know what dangers are on our fields. Thanks. Hope I don't gross you out with the pictures. Let me know if you want the video of them cleaning it out with just sub-Q analgesics. No thanks. No thank you. <laughs> the stills are enough. There's a reason I didn't go into medicine. Thank yeah. You. We have a couple really. of pictures of this very big gash. Yeah, not good. Stapled shut. Very red. Mom, my, uh, my uh, advice is don't play rugby. <laughs> but I understand that some people like it. Well, you know, my reaction to this was I wonder if this is going to keep him off the rugby field. You know, it sounds like he, you know, sustained some serious long-lasting yeah, injury to his knee. I hope he can still play. So this, these, uh, these casual fields, I guess, are very dirty. Uh, and yep. these geese, yeah, they're all over the place and they uh, – they they uh, foul the fields, but the professional fields are probably kept much cleaner, right? Maybe, but I don't same, know. At the same time, well, I mean, you can't control. You probably can't walk your dog happen. on them. Yeah, you probably can't walk your dog on the professional fields. But at the same time, there's there's a lot of overlap between what what doctors refer to as fecal bacteria and what we would think of as soil bacteria. Yeah, I mean, the fact is that there's bugs everywhere. Yeah, you know. Mm -hmm. So if you get dirt in a wound deep down. That's bad news. Right. And it doesn't specifically have to be fecal. I mean, what's our old quote from, from Dixon from somebody else about the uh, – there's a X feet of <clears throat> covering the earth? <laughs> That's right. There's yep. a thin layer covering the earth. That's right. All right, let's – uh, Detritus is what it is. Yes. You know, it's yeah. all – it's just home for bugs. All right. I thought the geese and the dogs don't help, I'm sure. No. Well, anyway, it's a good point because we were yep. talking about him picking up an intestinal infection, and here this is actually another danger that we didn't think about. Yes. Um, why don't we share some email? Rich, why don't you read the next one? It's from okay. Tim. Tim writes, Dear Vince, Rich, and Virology Podcasters, thanks for the great podcast. 
I am a beginner in the world of science, biology, and dare I say virology. I returned to school two years ago as a 38-year-old truck driver and I'm seeking a bachelor's in science. Good for you. Excellent. I would like to enter the, not there's anything wrong with being a truck driver, but good for you. Yeah. I would like to enter the medical field in some way and find your podcast to be highly stimulating. I have been listening to your virology podcast in addition to your virology class lecture, lectures from Columbia for about a year now, and I find it increasingly interesting. It takes me about four times per lecture to grasp a lot of the info, but I'm not giving up. Listen to that, boy. I want this guy in my class. <laughs> Um, one of the things I learned was that for a virus to be successful, it needs three important parts, entry into a host cell, replication, and it needs to release out of the cell. Recently, I read information on how the influenza virus can be affected by drugs that can indirectly inhibit the release of new virus particles. And I have a couple of questions. I am interested to know more about the effects of the antiviral medications amantadine and remantadine on reducing the severity of the influenza virus. Do these drugs actually stabilize the body's pH? And if so, how far does the pH have to shift before the virion will release its contents into the cytosol of a host cell? There are also drugs, also Tamavir and Zanamivir, which uh, affect both A and B types of influenza by blocking the glycoprotein neuraminidase so the new virus particles cannot be released. How well do these drugs work? And if they do, why are they, uh, why are they not more well known? Thanks, virology wannabe, Tim. <laughs> As for why they're not more well known, ask your doctor about Tamiflu. Yeah. You've probably heard of it, just not necessarily by the, by the generic name. Right. And also, they, uh, it is encouraged to be immunized rather than using yes. the antivirals. You'd rather, you'd rather not get the infection in the first place. But, yeah. but the, the antivirals are, have been quite successful, um, both in treating patients and commercially. Uh, so they, they do work. They are effective drugs um, to the extent that they can be. And, of course, the more you use them, the more you will get resistance. So. Yes. That's why it's and there's a fair them. amount of natural resist, or resistance to amantadine and romantadine. Right. Um, so the now, my, uh, my understanding is that these are um, these are uncoded amantadine and romantadine are uncoding inhibitors that um, yes. keep the virus from getting out of the endosome, right? Yeah. So these drugs actually block the ion channel in the virus particle. Okay, which is made up of the M2 protein. The virus gets into the endosome. Ordinarily, the virus gets into the endosome. Uh, fix me if I'm wrong here, but I think I got this right. And as a natural function of the endosome, there's a lowering of the pH inside the endosome. So this Correct. is a, uh, it's a fairly dramatic effect in the endosome. It's a couple of pH units. Maybe between five, uh, five and six, I think. Right. Yeah. So, right. So, but it's just in the endosome inside the cell. But right. it's just in right. the endosome inside the cell. And what happens is that uh, the uh, hydrogen ions can go through this ion channel into the into the particle, and so that reduces the pH in the particle, and that causes a huge uh, r a conformational change in the influenza uh, fusion pro the hemagglutinin to expose the fusion part of that, which then fuses with the endosome and dumps the nucleic acid into the cytoplasm. Right. Like so normally, that, right, right. I think so. So the low pH in the endosome causes this fusion activation of the HA. Right. right. So normally, and that's dependent cell, on this. But the sorry. M2 doesn't have anything to do with that. The, uh, the M2 it acidifies the interior, which then releases the ribonuclear protein from the interior of the particle once, okay. once the membranes fuse. Ah, okay. Okay. So low pH in the endosome... The HA catalyzes fusion. So now okay. the viral membrane is, is fused with the endosome. But then you still have this RNP stuck on the viral membrane. If the pH had not been lowered inside the particle, these would remain stuck there. Okay. But since the pH has lowered, the RNP floats out. Right. So, so the, the, cell, drug... the cell takes the virus in, and uh, when it takes stuff in, it pretty much eats it by acidifying the endosome. But the virus is smarter than that. It relies on that acidification to to get into the cell. 
So that's what, and the acidification inside the virus is what the amantadine is stopping. Yeah, that's right. Right. And so it doesn't actually do anything to the body's pH or anything like that. It just has to do with uh, a a slight local uh, channeling of the pH of the of the hydrogen ions that is malfunctioned uh, right. in the presence of the drug, so that um, so that you can't completely uncoat the virus. Yeah, those um, were among the first antivirals discovered in the '60s: amantadine and remantadine. Right. But we got a lot of resistance to them now, and you can't use them against every every uh, influenza type. So neuraminidase. That is a uh, viral membrane protein that cleaves sialic acid from uh, glycolipids and glycoproteins, which Mm -hmm. always struck me as being counterintuitive because sialic acid is, in fact, the receptor for the virus. So on the one hand, the hemagglutinin binds to sialic acid to attach to cells. On the other hand, you got this other thing, neuraminidase, that is cleaving the sialic acid off of cells. So it would be effectively destroying receptors. But as, if I understand it correctly, the, the usefulness of this is that once the cell uh, re, uh, once the virus buds from the cell, it can be stuck on the surface of the cell because the hemagglutinin is still binding these uh, sialic acid uh, residues. But if the neuraminidase then shaves those off, it releases the virus from the cell completely. So the neuraminidase promotes spread of the virus. And a, neuramin- a neuraminidase inhibitor would then uh, uh prevent spread and have an antiviral effect. Have I got that all right? Mm -hmm. Okay. You got it. Good. And I think he wants to know how well do these drugs work. Uh, They they work pretty, they're not 100% effective. Um, And and of course, it depends on the study that you look at. Um, There have been some efficacy studies show 30 to 40% reduction in symptoms. But if you look at mortality... Uh, treatment results in reduction between 60 to 90 percent in mortality rates in uh, in some studies. So they're pretty good. If you don't have uh, immunization and you have a, an outbreak in a susceptible population, they're useful. You'd, you'd want to use them prophylactically, right? Well, the problem is that you have to take them within 24 hours of first symptoms, 24 right. to 48 hours, right? Timing is very, very important. Yeah. Past two days, they're not going to work. Right. So you got to catch it, and that's not often easy because, you know, during the flu flu season, basically, if you have flu-like symptoms, they'll give you these without even knowing if you have flu, mm-hmm. and you could have some other virus infection. That's why, if you're doing efficacy studies, you have to make sure that uh, individuals are infected with with influenza virus. Right. Anyway, Tim, good questions. Yeah, yeah. keep at it. And um, I will refer you to lecture number five in my course to learn more about what we just told you today. I wonder if he. I wonder if he drives a big eighteen wheeler. You know. Hey, tell us what you, you ever, drive. You yeah. ever driven in a truck like that? It must be amazing. I have never. I haven't. There you go. <laughs> so write us in and tell us about trucks. We told you about. Uh, you know, influenza. Tell us about trucks. All right, cool. <laughs> this week in trucks. This week in trucks. <laughs> Alan, can you read the one from Tony? Sure. Tony writes, Hi, Twivers. You're probably bored with hearing this by now, but you guys are great. I'm no, Tony, bored. we're not the least good bored with that. <laughs> I never get bored of that. <laughs> Congratulations on the great job of making virology accessible to the masses. We're not as dumb as television and the newspapers would lead you to believe. I've been listening since just after you started podcasting, and I've been meaning to email you for about two years. I've got a lot of questions saved up. Feel free to stop reading at any point. First, a few episodes ago, a listener asked for suggestions for virology software. My suggestion is a PC game style virtual virology lab where you can grow virtual viruses in a virtual culture medium containing virtual cells. The cells may or may not have the correct receptors on their surface to allow the virus to enter, and even then, they may not be able to replicate. You could find this out by doing virtual plaque assays, all this with no undergraduates spilling anything or catching anything. The virtual virus would mutate at each re- replication cycle, maybe enhancing its virulence or transmissibility. Oh, that's cool. Right. 
That's a cool idea for a game. So you remember there was a a lady in Scotland, I believe it was, who wanted suggestions for – she had some money she could spend on developing software. So this would be cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Nice. Good idea. All right. Second, uh, last year sometime you reviewed a paper regarding replication of viruses which had been tagged with different colored fluorescent protein. When they infected cells at quite high MOI, there were very, there were few progeny expressing mixtures of colors. Most expressed single colors. I didn't really understand the significance of this at the time. Is it just saying a cell is not just a bag of chemicals, but has a very structured interior? Is it saying more than that? Mm. So, so that's this, the color me infected episode. I'm assuming. Uh, yes, this is uh, Lynn Enquist's or his laboratories. Uh, brainbow herpes viruses. Okay, yes. so they made these herpes viruses that, uh, well, I mean, to make a long story short, you could actually infect cells with viruses that, in effect, uh, expressed uh, different colors of uh, uh, proteins, and they expected that they would get out of this the same sort of mixtures of proteins out of every cell. But what they found was that cells would produce a subset, either one color or another. And I guess the bottom line was that there's a, a selection for a, a only, uh, if you infect a cell with a lot of viruses and you have a, a initiated infection with a, a bunch, there's only a few that get selected out of that that actually get amplified and um, uh, passed on to the next, next infection. Right. I, th- I think his conclusion about a very structured interior is is a nice way of looking at that. It kind of says that there's more organization to it than than you might have anticipated to start with. Right. It's not just everybody gets in and everybody replicates. And exactly. It's it's there's a there's a strong structure and selection of which virus wins uh, in a in a given cell, and that's going to determine what comes out. So last week when I was at Princeton, I met with the postdoc who did that work, ah, okay. uh, Oren Kobilier, and he's continuing to work on it. And so one of their ideas is that there's something limiting. So these viruses were uh, replicate in the cell nucleus. These are herpes viruses. And there's some, perhaps a structure that is limiting in the interior and so, so that if you dump 10 in, only one's one or two. Are well, usually taken. it is five to seven genomes replicate per cell nucleus. Okay. That was the number. So right. for some reason, that's the limit. It could be that the virus sets up an interference and, and others can't replicate, or there could be limited numbers. So they're trying to sort that out. Um, so it's, it's still an ongoing story. But it's a great question. Uh, yeah. yeah, and and it's... It's really okay to be confused about that <laughs> because that whole that, – that, those experiments I found really difficult to get my head around. That, that Very paper, difficult to yeah, think about. That paper was amazing and also extremely complex. Right. And I, I hope we did a, an adequate job <laughs> of explaining it. But it's very, very, very cool for, um, for virologists and I think um, – you know, you you got a pretty good message from it. The thing that I want to comment on here, he says, does it, does it have a structured interior? Is it saying more than that? Well, saying that it has a structured interior is a lot. Yeah. Yes. In itself, because just to do that would be very complicated. So this is often the way it is in science. Things which on the surface look simple. Oh, isn't it more than that? It's in fact very complicated. Yeah. All right. Uh, three, for us non-academics, I'd love to hear a day-in-the-life episode of a graduate student, a postdoc, a PI, and so on. Great idea. Yeah, I like That's that. a good idea. A wonderful idea. I think we will put that on our TWIV ideas document. Yeah. Except you don't want to hear a day in my life, though, because it's pretty boring. We do. <laughs> we do want to hear. <laughs> well, we could all do a day in our lives. Then we could get sure. a postdoc, and then we can get a couple of students. That's easy. I got plenty of them walking around here. All right. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. All right, Tony. I'm going to put. I have a Google Doc called uh, Twiv Ideas, and I'm going to put it in there. Day in the life. 
Okay. All right. So four, being an Australian, I'm always interested in your discussions of myxomatosis, Khaleesi virus, Hendra, and dengue. Alan's prescription, don't raise horses in the rainforest, is a little hard to follow. There are large flying fox colonies in the botanical gardens of both Melbourne and Sydney. Luckily, there are no inner city horses. Uh, and he gives a link to um, a myxomatosis story. Read the paragraph headed, Hype Led to Panic. Uh, there are some famous names in it. My mother told me she had dengue several times as a child growing up in Queensland and was really ill. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. So <clears throat> remember we talked about the dengue Wolbachia study. In that, mm-hmm. that was in Australia because there is dengue there, as you yeah. see. And uh, yeah, I was I was being somewhat facetious about don't raise horses in the rainforest. I know people can't always choose their locations, but yeah, uh, that's the thing with uh, Alan. You have to be you have to know when he's being serious and not yes. right. Sometimes it's not easy. <laughs> uh, so he concludes. I'm working my way through Vince's online virology course. Uh, it has really helped me understand the podcasts. Like Dixon, I now know there are seven fundamental types of viruses. <laughs> Regards, Tony Bland. P.S. Here are a couple more things I almost forgot. I'd really like to hear more about the fossil viruses in the human genome. You had a great episode on that a while ago, and it left me wanting more. Also, I'd like to hear about the process of um, uh, getting a vaccine out of the lab and ready for release. You've touched on it briefly a few, uh, several times. I had no idea it was such a large undertaking. More details, please. Another good idea. That's another excellent idea. If we can get somebody... Um, Somebody from Merck or... Uh, uh, actually, uh, my first uh, student was, uh, I think he could talk about this. He was involved in uh, basically producing the, if I understand it correctly, producing the flu mist that went into clinical trials. And he's Excellent. now, that's gotten him up. Uh, he's with, uh, who is it, does that? Metamune now. Okay? Yes. That actually right. takes care of that, so... He could do that. We can get other people as well. That's a great idea. Yeah, I'm pretty familiar with the process just from covering it a lot, but it would, we should get somebody who is in the industry. and uh, Somebody who actually did it. And, and has done it. Yeah. And unfortunately, uh, Maurice isn't around anymore. I was going to say we need Maurice yeah. Hilleman. Or uh, we could get Tony Hilleman. Tom Monath would probably uh, do Silence. it. Silence. Crickets. <laughs> Crickets. So... Uh, this uh, link he uh, gives to the myxomatosis uh, story, we may have talked about this before, but it's it's cool because after the myxomatosis was I- introduced to kill all the rabbits, a human encephalitis epidemic began spreading through the uh, part of uh, Australia. And in no time, the public was pointing to the CSIRO scientists and blaming the deadly new uh, rabbit disease for the uh, fatal human disease. So that's where the panic comes from. Right. In a remarkable demonstration designed to quell public anxiety, Professor Frank Fenner and two other top Australian scientists, uh, Dr. McFarland Burnett and Dr. Ian uh, Clooney's Ross, injected themselves with doses of myxomatosis. It did them no harm and the public's fears were allayed. Outstanding. <laughs> yeah, this, this page is familiar. I think we... Uh had this before up at some point. And uh, Frank lived to be, what, 92, 93? Yep. yep. So I'm going to go inject myself with some <laughs> we'll myxomatosis virus. All right, why don't you videotape the whole thing, okay? <laughs> okay. We can put it up here on Twiv. Great. All right, let's do some picks of the week. Alan, what do you have? Um, I have. Um... Oh, wait a minute. Did you get all the way through the PS on this uh, email? Yeah, we did. I think so. I'm sorry. Yes. I was, I was uh, surfing. Sorry. Yeah, you're, you're distracted. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm not like you know. Alan can Alan can multitask. Okay, I can only do one thing at a time. So if I need to surf, you know, forget it. I'm gone. Okay. All right. So my pick of the week is um, this is something that uh, Jennifer Fraser, who runs the Artful Amoeba blog, um, put up. She uh, picked out several of these uh, fundraising projects for classrooms that want to buy microscopes. Um, and this is this donors choose site, um, where you can pick various small, uh, things to donate money to where you could donate a small amount of money and actually make a direct difference to something that you could see. Um, 
So uh, I, I thought this was a really clever idea. She went through there and picked out projects that were specifically targeted at buying microscopes for schools that are in poverty-stricken areas. Excellent. And uh, so that that's my pick of the week. She's called it Amoebas for a Better Science Tomorrow Classroom Microscope Drive. Um, and I went in there and, and donated to one of these. I, I picked the Miraculous Microscopes Project in Waterloo, Iowa, but... Uh, that was semi-random. All of these are, I think, very, very worthwhile um, choices that if people wanted to to do something to promote microbiology in, in places where it might really matter, um, this would be something it's to cool. do. Yeah. Excellent. Go over Great. And listen Thank you. That's a good idea. Yep. Rich, what do you have? Uh, I just, this is a uh, another video that I picked up. Uh, from one of my friends on Facebook, an ex-UF student named Rachel. And uh, I just, you know, was on Facebook cruising through, clicked this, and I thought it was cool. It's an animation uh, of uh, conception and fetal development, and it's uh, just very well done. It's about five minutes long or something like that. And I just thought it was a really uh, good example of uh, uh, that kind of animation. And it's actually, as far as I can tell, really accurate as well. Yeah, this I, I watched this thing when I saw your link in the in the show notes, and uh, it's really, really astonishingly well done. Yeah, it's good. On the on the other hand, as I was watching it, I thought, you know, porn has gotten way too explicit. <laughs> but no, no, it's not. It's not actually porn. It's on YouTube. People can go watch it. It's it's, it's very good, fun and it's uh, it's neat video. Unfortunately, I can't play it because uh, these YouTube videos all auto start. Yes, right. And no, you will can't do that. Interfere, now. but I, I did look Have at a look it before. Later. It looks cool. Uh, my pick is a Wolfram Alpha, which I'm sure many people have heard about. Yep. Interesting. We did not pick it previously. Uh, this was suggested by my son Aiden. Uh, I was said to him one night, "I need a pick," and he said, "Ah, oh, Wolfram Alpha. I use it all the time for chemistry." So you, it just gives you a search field, and you type something in that you want to know about. Let's say methanol. We'll type in methanol, and it will give you the formula, the structural diagram, the 3D structure, basic properties, liquid properties, thermodynamic properties, phase diagrams, chemical identifiers. You get the picture, everything you want to know. Holy cow. It's a really cool Website. Yeah, but it's yeah. Not, I, it's not for everything. If you type in polio virus, however, it's not going to give you the chemical structure. It it gives you some facts, and that's it. So it's good for certain things and not others, right? Yeah. Use this, I, when, uh, this, when this thing first came out, I um, I went to it and tossed in a few test queries, and it is, as you say, it's great for stuff that you think is going to have a fairly straightforward set of facts as an answer. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, you know, being the, the snarky guy that I am, I typed in, how do you feel? Uh, and it gave me an error message. <laughs> but now I've noticed, um, and that in fact, I, I told my mom that uh, she works at an engineering firm and, and had looked into this thing. And and she sent them an email about it. it. said, you know, I get an error message when I type in this query. And about a month ago, I think it was, she, she got an email back saying, uh, we've now fixed that. Hmm. So I you can now it. ask Wolfram Alpha how it feels, and it will it will tell you. I just typed in, I love you. It says, how nice. Be assured the feeling is mutual. <laughs> I did. How do you feel? It says, I am doing well, thank you. Yes. What? If you ask it why, it says because. One thing that's interesting <laughs> here is um, the, uh, the, the returns you get on any query is not text. It's actually a graphic. Yes. So that it can't be spidered by other services, you know. Right. Can't be stolen, which is curious. Uh, this is going on my bookmarks bar. I was not, I was not familiar with this. Oh, and good. I'm cool. glad that we can help you. Yeah. All right. Uh, we have a listener pick of the week from Bill, who says, Hello, professors. I very much enjoy your show. And on behalf of your many listeners was chagrined, that there have not been sufficient listener suggestions for there to be a pick of the week for episode 144. I don't think this book has been previously included as a pick of Viralution by Frank Ryan. It covers several themes you have discussed and overlaps to some extent an early TWIV discussion with Luis Villarreal, TWIV number 25. 
and puts forth an interesting theory on the contribution viruses may have made to the evolution of species. Much of it is rather speculative, but I think many readers may find it of interest. Anyone read this? Nope. I, nope. Okay. Going to go on the list. Thank you, Bill. Check it out. Virolution. I hadn't heard Frank, of it. Great Frank name. Ryan, the mm-hmm. author, is a physician and the author of Darwin's Blind Spot, The Forgotten Plague, acclaimed by the World Health Organization and a New York Times Book of the Year. Hmm. Nice. And he's also uh, author of something called Virus X. <clears throat> well, we'll so, have to check it out. Yeah. Sounds like he likes viruses. Yeah. I guess. Okay. Maybe we should have him on Twiv. Sure. Read the book first. Read the book first. Yes. Yep. <clears throat> and that will do it for Twiv. You can find us at the iTunes podcast directory, the Zoom Marketplace at microbeworld.org. If you're new to TWIV, go over to iTunes and do leave a comment. That helps us to stay on the front page. And there are over 170 comments, which is really great. It's more than most podcasts, and that's why we're always on the top of the lists in in iTunes. And that's one way you can help us uh, to stay on top so more people discover us. There's also an app for your iPhone or Android device. You can get that at microbeworld.org slash app. Do send us your questions and comments. We love them. TWIV at TWIV. Dot TV and don't forget our Facebook fan page, facebook.com slash this week in virology. Rich Condit is at the University of Florida, Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. You're quite welcome. Always always a pleasure. Always fun, I agree. Thank yep. You. It's a gas. Good good having you guys with us. Alan Dove is at Allendove.com. Thank you, Alan. Always a hoot. I didn't know you were snarky. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you describe yourself. Uh, sometimes, yes. Rich, are you snarky? Uh, I don't even know what snarky is. Uh, I I sarcastic. Know and, uh, no, I don't think I'm really snarky. And uh, I'm Vincent Racaniello. I don't think I'm snarky. <laughs> nah. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We will be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>